Hey everyone, Brian Zane here with my review of the Great American Bash edition of NXT for July 6th, 2021. Very solid show and I can't wait to go into it in more detail. But first, a quick little plug for the new YouTube channel for This Week in Regret, the podcast that Jay Biggs and I launched about a month ago. We're four episodes in and we're getting stronger every week. I cannot wait for this week's edition is going to drop on Thursday. We'll be talking about the recent arrest of Jimmy Uso and the recent news that Selena Vega and Lana have made in the last week or so. Plus, Jay and I start taking viewer requests as to what topics you want us to talk about on the show. It all goes down this Thursday, this week in Regret. Go subscribe to the channel right now. The link is in the iCard in the corner of your screen, as well as in the description. Not only do you get the YouTube link, but also the SoundCloud link. Yes, I do have a SoundCloud to promote, and that be it. And as always, like what you like, don't be a dick. Let's begin. First match of the night for the NXT Tag Titles as MSK defend against Tommaso Ciampa and Timothy Thatcher. I love the contrast and the clash of styles in this matchup here because I think it works really well in their favor. Because with the Ciampa and Thatcher, you have the very physical, the tough boy stuff, the smacks and the strikes. Meanwhile, MSK, you've got their impressive athleticism. Made for a very good combination here. A couple of close calls in this one. We get that spot, and I've talked about it a little bit more in the last couple of months. But I just feel it's such a trope now in all these NXT Tag Title matches for the last like four years running now where it's like it's a pinfall or a submission and oh accidentally the other two guys fall backwards oh no they fell on the guy and the pinfall got broken up who could have guessed that would happen but in this case it's Champa who falls into Thatcher mid submission and in the chaos you got Wesley with the surprise roll up on Thatcher to win the match and retain the fans boo MSK here as a result which surprised me on one level because I don't know why they're booing them because they still seem pretty much baby faced to me but you know what after the one two punch of seeing those two tropes back to back. I'm like, yeah, I'd boo them too, I think. That being said, it was still a very strong match, and if you kind of d d unplug from what happened at the very end, it's still an enjoyable match on the whole, but just th those two tropes that I'm just getting really tired of seeing, but again, not take away from the rest of the match, because the first 98% of it was really good. William Regal and Samoa Joe are in the ring, and they're calling out Karrion Cross and Johnny Gargano to settle, try and settle this beef they've been having for the last several weeks, ever since TakeOver. So they both come out, and the format and the order which they talk is very interesting. It's not like authority figures talk, then the wrestlers talk. It's like ABAB kind of, where Johnny says that he lives rent-free in Carrion's head, and there's a lot of room in there. Regal announces that, oh, there's going to be a title match of these two next week. Carrion Cross says to talk some smack and says, you know, he says that Johnny is wearing Candice LeRae's pants and everything. Samoa Joe then is announced as the special guest referee for the match. And then uh, there's this moment here where uh, Gargano gets one last word in where he says, you know, hey, you know, you talk about my wife's pants, but you couldn't lace my wife's boots which is a great comeback, great zinger for Gargano. And Carrion wants to go in on him, but Joe stands right in his way. So this segment was okay, just setting up the match for next week and just kind of putting a bow on that. I like, you know, it's very clear to me, it seems, that they're going to, they seem to be very heavily teasing something with Carrion and Samoa Joe in the match itself. And we also hear later on in the show, Joe, very, very deep seed planting here. It's like, if I'm, if I'm not provoked, everything's going to be cool, which means he's going to be provoked. It seems very inevitable at this point, but the segment itself was okay. Kushida with a promo on the Diamond Mind after their big attack on him a couple of weeks ago and saying that he is ready for them. Up next, the match for the Million Dollar Championship, a rematch between LA Knight and Cameron Grimes. But the twist here is if Grimes loses, he is forced to become LA Knight's butler. Very good match here. I love this moment where Cameron skins the cat on the ropes, but he backs right into sort of a KOD or I guess kind of a WWE safe version of the Burning Hammer by LA Knight. Some good telegraphing in the story here, this match where Knight has the Million Dollar title, but at one point he drops it and it kind of falls through the apron and lands on the floor. And then a couple of minutes later, he DDTs Grimes on the floor on the belt and the referee doesn't catch that. Grimes very narrowly avoids a count out, but he walks right into the BFT for Knights to win and retain. So I thought it was a great match. I think the right person won here. I know when I said that when they were first fighting for the title, I thought that Grimes is the first champion would be better. But the more I think about it, it just makes more sense for LA to have been the first champion all along. And this is a great move as well. I mean, it just seems like one of those things where the, the situation writes itself. I can't wait for the segments we'll be seeing with Cameron Grimes as LA Knight's butler and just what kind of comedy will ensue from there and how much sympathy you'll garner for uh, Grimes before his inevitable breakup from that. I hope they make it last a little bit. I feel the last couple of times I've seen some kind of like subservient gimmick or stipulation for a match like it never lasts very long and so I'd like this to go at least a few weeks before we get some kind of blow up. Uh, stretch it out as long as you can I think because I think there's a lot of comedy gold to be mined from this.
We're backstage with Raquel Gonzalez and Dakota Kai. They're asked about the uh, two teams fighting for the women's tag titles later on. And they basically talk trash about both teams and they kind of direct their attention to Ember Moon and Shotzi Blackheart, threatening to put Shotzi on the shelf for good next time they see her. And then we see the participants in this year's breakout tournament on stage. You've got Trey Baxter, Carmelo Hayes, uh, Andre Chase, who's the former Harlem Bravado, Josh Briggs, Ikemanjiro, Joe Gacy, Odyssey Jones, and Duke Hudson, the former Anthony Henry. Henry. Uh, we find out next week the first round of action in that tournament is going to see Duke Hudson versus Ikemanjiro. So looking forward to this tournament. Up next, a match of the women's tag titles as The Way defend against Io Shirai and Zoe Stark. It's a very competitive match here. Pretty even-handed, I'd say, for the bulk of this thing. A few, several minutes into the match, though, suddenly the lights cut out. We see the battery that's been charging for the last several weeks on the big screen. It hits 100%. The lights come up, and it's Tegan Knox, the woman who's been through no fewer than three knee surgeries since being in NXT. She is back with once again, seemingly at 100%, she stares down her old rival Candice LeRae, and LeRae looks to be in total shock at seeing her on stage. In the chaos and distraction, you've got Zoe hitting the K360 on Indy to win the match. And so, new women's tag team champions, kind of a shocker there, this unlikely team of Io and Zoe celebrating, and then as that happens, Tegan beats up Candice and chases her off. And then during the commercial break, we see Dexter Loomis show up and carry Indy away. So I was always wondering what was happening in that storyline, so glad it's not totally dead. It seems to be revived once again. This next thing I want to say isn't an indictment on the match itself, because I think it was okay, but I think it's just interesting that we're less than six months into the uh, NXT Women's Tag Title Experiment, and we already have four different combinations of women who have become the champions in that time. It's not, I don't know if it's quite hot potato level yet, but I think there was more you could do with Indy and Candice as the tag team champions here, and I think putting the belts on Io and Zoe seems kind of weird. I mean, it's a good rub for Zoe, Obviously, I mean, I think the way her kind of up and down booking since she first debuted uh, has been interesting. And this seems kind of a nice like way to correct that. And putting the belt on Io and have her bouncing back from losing the women's title earlier this year is a heck of a way to bounce back. She comes back to TV and is a women's tag team champion within only a few weeks. So pretty quick turnaround for Io here. But it's just it, lately it seems that the most important or most interesting stories surrounding the women's tag teams have been the ones who are not the champions, and that's kind of sad. Tony Storm interviewed backstage. She says she wants a shot at Raquel Gonzalez's championship, and then meanwhile, she also rejects Saray's challenge to a match, which means it's going to definitely happen at some point in the future. On we go to Hit Row's North American Championship Cypher Celebration. Now, last week, Isaiah Swerve Scott beat Bronson Reed to become the new champion, called it, by the way, and so this week they're doing a Cypher Celebration, and yes, I had to look up what that meant, what Cypher meant. It's a gathering of rappers rapping. I'm not ashamed that I didn't know what it was. I had to look it up, folks, and so, yeah, yeah, that's what this was. It was the group. It was B Fab. It was Top Dalla, and then it was Swerve, all doing little raps. And Ashanti the Adonis was the DJ. And then all four of them get in the ring and do the Hit Row theme song. I mean, it was a whole dang performance. It was like a concert, not unlike the Poppy stuff. And I'm not going to say it was a great segment of the show. I'm not going to list it as a pro in the show. But I think it's just another great layer and another great just dimension to add to Hit Row. This group has fast become one of the most interesting and entertaining parts of NXT. And I'm definitely here for it and along for the ride. I think that this is just, you know, this one more stepping stone of what this group can be. I'm really excited for the potential of Hit Row in the next few months to come. All we go to our main event, the rematch from TakeOver, Stand and Deliver. It's Adam Cole versus Kyle O'Reilly. This one, however, is a straight-up wrestling match, and boy, do they straight-up wrestle. This is just a fantastic technical contest of these two. Both guys going for each other's injured legs. There's some, like, trash talking about Kyle's wife, and Kyle goes, like, all snappy on him, but Adam Cole is able to capitalize and, and super kick uh, Kyle's leg on the corner, which is pretty impressive. Uh, at the end, Kyle whiffs the top rope knee drop and uh, he takes the last shot from behind, but somehow he's able to kick out of that. And then you've got uh, Cole hitting the Panama Sunrise after one attempt fails, but right afterward, uh, Kyle's leg gives out. Cole recovers, hits the Sunrise, hits one more last shot to win. And this is just an emphatic victory. Such a great match with these two. What a, what a main event. What a matchup. And I think, you know, it makes all the sense in the world that that Cole wins this matchup here because then you have the inevitable rubber match. But these two have a lot to live up to based on their last two encounters for sure because this match was a great chapter in the rivalry. I really like this show. I think it was very strong overall. Some takeover quality matches and moments throughout. Not a lot on this show this week that I could complain about that would be worthy of knocking the grade down to any significant degree. Just overall very enjoyable. I think if there's anything about it, you know, maybe it's like a lack 
of kind of the, the feeling of wanting more or like what's going to happen next week. There's not maybe not that much in terms of intrigue, but in terms of a standalone episode with some just great matches and some very interesting moments of storyline progression, like Tegan Knox's return, for example, uh, or the, the progression of Ellie Knight and Cameron Grimes, for example, I think this is, yeah, really strong episode this week. But what did you all think of NXT, folks? Let me know in the comments section below. And of course, I'll be back here tomorrow night with my review of AEW Dynamite from the road, the Road Rager in Miami, Florida. It'll be really fun to see the first AEW show outside of Daly's Place in over a year and a half. I can't wait to see what that's going to be like. But until then, folks, I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.